Well, hello. It's uh, nice to see me again. Um, I don't know if you can see, let me make it wider. You can see right over my shoulder here, there you all are. So um, keeps me honest to uh, have you guys looking over my shoulder um, on a regular basis. So you can feel good about that. Um, so let's get to work. Um, so if you, when, you might remember when we, when we left off, when last we were together, um, we tackled this first set of identities and I called them facts. Um, then we didn't really have to do a whole lot of work to, to justify them, they're, they're pretty simple. By the way, I will um, show you here. They're there. Those are the ones that we looked at and work with um, previously. And those will be kind of our main ones um, for a while. But we're going to take a different tack today. And this is actually, um, I think it's kind of a big deal. This is probably the first time um, that you will have done something this formally uh, since geometry. Let me explain what we're doing. Um, an identity is a fact, but it's only a fact if you can prove it's a fact. And so basically what we're doing is proof here. And that's why I say the last time you did this was probably um, geometry. The difference is that there are some really strict rules with um, proving identities that we have to follow. And you'll be tempted before this is all said and done to cheat the system. But um, no, we can't do that. So let me sort of start out here with, with what we would be tasked with doing and then what some of our approaches are. So one of the tasks would be to prove some statement that A equals B. Now that's not super fancy, but we're not talking numbers here. This is actually like a statement like, cosecant squared x times sine x equals one minus tangent, whatever it may be. To do this, we have three options. And uh, I wanna go through and outline the options. And then I'm just gonna walk you through a series of examples. Um, you'll find them in your book, um, but we'll walk through a series of examples so you can see what this process looks like in action. So <clears throat> option one, and I'll, I'll actually, I'll identify it here, but option one is turning whatever's on the left side into whatever's on the right side. So you'll see what this means in a second, but it's gonna be rewriting this expression on the left-hand side in different ways, maybe multiple times, um, with some justification, although yeah, there's a little bit of uh, freedom here. It's a little bit less stringent maybe than you would find in geometry where you've got to have a statement and a reason, a statement and a reason. Um, it just needs to be very clear why you're doing what you're doing. And so what we'll do is A is changed into B. That's option one, okay? Let me erase all this. Option two is B, whoops, gets turned into A. So you'll see sometimes where one side of the identity is actually kind of complicated or not really clear how you would simplify it, but the other side is much uh, more obvious. And so a uh, second option would be B is turned, and this is again through several, several steps, B turns into A. And then once we have that, we have A equals A and we're done. The third process is a little bit more complicated, but it'll happen sometimes where you're not gonna easily get one side of the identity to be turned into the other side. And in fact, you'll have to work with both of them in this form where A uh, gets changed into some new statement, C, and B also gets turned into that new statement, C, and then C equals C. So I would write it as A goes to C and B goes to C. 
And if this is all seeming a little bit hypothetical and not really clear, then way to go. You're right in the right spot. Um, so we're just going to start beginning this process and we're going to be using again, primarily for now, just these identities, these ones that I've given you before. Uh, you remember that there's many more to come, but for now at least, that's all we're going to use. So let me go on to the next page. And I want to go through uh, a series of problems. I have three problems we'll do. And just want to walk you through them and give you some, some experience with this. But I want to make this really clear. There is one really fundamental foundational rule in this process. And um, well, I'll just, I'll just say it sort of my own terms. Um, no crossing the no crossing the equal sign. And you're like, well, why can't I cross the equal sign? Why can't I add like sine x to both sides or add two to both sides? And the reason why is because if we're being asked to prove A equals B, we don't know that A equals B yet. And until we've proved that A equals B, you can't use any properties of equality. <coughs> the properties of equality say, if A equals B, then you can start doing stuff to both sides. You can add, you can subtract, you can multiply, divide, you can take square root, you can raise it to a power, whatever it may be. But until we've shown that A equals B, we can't do that. So no crossing the equal sign. And I don't know that today as I look at this problems um, that that's gonna be a big issue, but uh, it'll come up here in just a few, few days. So I'm now getting my book out. I hope you get your book out as well. If you don't have your book handy, you may pause this recording and then you can go get your book. And you can remind yourself, hey, next time we have a session, like maybe on Wednesday when we're live, we'll talk about that in just a sec. Um, you can have your book with you just so you can kind of follow along. But you've got my notes too, so you can follow that. What I want you to look at is on page 355 to start with. So I'm just going to put a little side note here, page 355. And these are... Um, I don't think I'd call them rules. I, I think I just call them tips and maybe some hints for how to attack identity proofs. Um, and again, we're going to start, I, I want to say fairly simply, but they may not be simple to you, uh, but we're going to start with ones that are, that are pretty accessible and then we'll slowly get into more and more complicated ones over the next couple of weeks. So just some hints here. Work with one side of the equation at a time. That's the A turning into B, B turning into A, or maybe both of them turning into C. Um, factor an expression, add fractions together, common denominators, and so on. Look for opportunities to use the fundamental identities. That's that page that I just showed you that I hope you have handy. Um, when in doubt, convert everything to sine and cosine, which is often a really nice uh, technique. And then number five is actually not very formal, but just try something. It just try something. Start doing something. It'll be a, kind of amazing to you sometimes how um, just starting something will, will change the form of the identity enough that you'll be able to um, pretty easily see, see where, where the solution lies. So um, all we're going to do today is three examples. I'm going to start on page 356. Uh, it's going to be the checkpoint at the bottom of the page, number two. So I'm going to write it up real quick. It's two cosecant squared. I will be consistent here, beta. I'm going to erase this, by the way. Oops, erase this so it's not confusing. So we are on um, now page 356, checkpoint. Two cosine squared beta equals one over uh, one minus cosine beta plus one plus cosine beta. 
and I, I, I want to believe that you might even recall what this this type of problem looks like or how we're going to attack it. This is going to be one of those uh, get a common denominator type problems. So our goal here is going to be try to figure out what that common denominator needs to be. And I hope you'll see that. Oh, let me back up real quick. This is a little bit dicey because we only have one real way to look at cosecant squared that deals with cotangent, but I don't really feel like we've got cotangent going on here. So this is going to be one where I'm just going to start working with one side and see where that leads me. Um, I might need to go back to the left side eventually, but let's see where this leads me. I'm going to multiply this by one minus cosine beta and one minus cosine beta. And then on this side, a little bit tighter here, it's going to be one plus cosine beta and one plus cosine beta. Okay, so let's let me clean this up just a little bit. <clears throat> On the top, we have one plus cosine beta plus, now I'm going to distribute here, one minus cosine beta. And you'll you can kind of see what's coming here. Those are going to cancel out. Um, and then we have over this is a difference of squares, right? One minus cosine squared beta. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with one plus one is two over one minus cosine squared beta. Now this is the point in this process where you're gonna kind of start thinking, am I heading in the right direction? So if you look at that expression we have on the right and you say, well, I see a two on the right and a two on the left, that's a pretty good sign we're headed the right direction. But then we have this cosecant squared and this one minus cosine squared. And then you think, oh, wait a minute, I know things. I know that one minus cosine squared, I'm right here. Well, I can't, I can't highlight it here, but one minus cosine squared in the Pythagorean identity is uh, sine squared. See that right here? Well, I hope you can see me moving my cursor. So with that, here's what we can do. I can replace that with, so I have the two on top. I replace this whole thing here with sine squared beta. And now I try to see what can I make out of those two. And I realize, oh, of course, one over sine squared is just, oops, just cosecant beta, yikes. So this is a case where we started here, then we went to 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 here. So like there, 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 there. If I had a tall page, I would have just gone this, done this vertically, but I kind of wanted to save room. So here now we've proved this identity, that two cosine squared beta equals one over one minus cosine beta plus one over one plus cosine beta. Now, to be completely honest with you, it's not gonna change our lives a lot that we have that identity, but this is the, this is the, the process we're working on. Okay, this is where I'd ask you for questions and you'd ask me questions, but I think what we'll do on this is, um, as you're going through these problems, jot down, you know, pause the recording, jot down any questions you have and maybe send it to me right in real time. Just shoot me a text or something or send me an email if that's easier and just say, hey, can you explain that to me one more time? Then I'll go back and look at the, um, at the, you know, the, the section of the recording or the, the lesson and, and help you with that, okay? Of course, when we do this live, it'll be much easier and maybe that's what we'll be end up doing. Okay, let's go to question number two. This is gonna be page, whoop. 357, this is gonna be checkpoint number four now. And I hope you, you understand I'm doing the checkpoints because you can read the examples on your own. So you don't really need me to go through the example with you. Um, <clears throat> I think we'll do both of these and I think I'll, I'll show you why in just a second. So let's go this, let's go cotangent. Cotangent, well, let's make it cotangent. Cotangent x secant x equals cosecant x. And, and I think that um, 
I want to draw your attention to the, I don't know if it's really a hint, but look at right by the words example four, it says converting to sines and cosines. This is a really good example of a problem that very likely will be easily solved if we convert everything to sine and cosine, because we've got so many different expressions. In fact, these are all the three reciprocal identities. Um, let's see what we come down to. Cotangent x is cosine x over sine x. And secant is one over cosine x. And I hope that's pretty obvious now. Cosines cancel and we end up with one over sine x equals cosecant x and then cosecant x equals cosecant. So it's actually not that difficult a problem um, when we decide to turn it into, I'll put this up here too, when we decide to turn it into a uh, sine and cosine problem. Now you notice I'm not really justifying any of these uh, st steps on the right hand side. That's what I was getting at before. Um, in your book you'll see in red uh, that there are some justifications there. What I'm going to say is if what you're doing is pretty obvious, it's clear what your substitution you're making and what change you're making, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I don't think as I look through these anything is like I don't really need to justify that one over cosine x. I'm looking at um, example 4a. I think I need to justify that one over cosine x is secant x. So um, I, I, I'm not going to worry about it. I want you to be very clear in what you're doing. Make sure you know why you're doing it, but I don't think you need to document every single step. Okay, this was 4a. Let's go and do uh, 4b real quick. So 4b. Again, this is checkpoint. For B says cosecant X minus sine X, and that's a little bit weird because those are reciprocals of each other, equals cosine X cotangent X. Hmm. So this is, this is one of those cases where you kind of sit there and you're like, uh, what do I do? Um, there's a lot of things we could do. I mean, on the right-hand side over here, I look at this and I think, oh, maybe I turn this into a sine and cosine uh, fraction, but cotangent is cosine on top. So that's not really going to, eh, that's not really going to simplify. It's not going to save me a whole lot. Over here, um, there's nothing squared. I don't know that creating a difference of squares is going to be a big deal. I think what I'm inclined to do is just go one over sine x here. Minus sine x. And let's see where that leads. And I want to be clear. I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, as I, I, okay, I do know. I know where I'm going with this. But as I'm looking at these problems, like I don't necessarily always know exactly what I'm going to be getting into. I just want to try it. And I'm thinking about what this might look like. And I might go for a while on the left-hand side. And then I might say, well, let me try to figure out the right-hand side and see what I can do there. So on this line right here, I feel like I'd like to make a common denominator, which means I need sine x on the bottom. I need another sine x on top, right? So what's that going to look like? It's going to look like 1 minus sine squared x over sine x. And this is that moment when you look at the, that number and you're like, hey, I know that, dude. I know that 1 minus sine squared x is just cosine squared x. Right? Because that, that's our Pythagorean identity. And, and, and I'm going to go back just to make sure you all see um, exactly where that comes from. So as I'm looking at these Pythagorean identities, I have to be comfortable with one minus some of these, especially sine and cosine. One minus sine squared gets me cosine squared. One minus cosine squared gets me sine squared. So those are ones that you're going to want to keep handy. And as you work with these more and more, you'll begin to see those patterns emerge. Okay, so what does that leave us with over here? Well, I have cosine x. And remember over here, I said this one is not going to be necessarily cancelable, but this is going to be, whoops, this is going to be cosine x over sine x. And you see what we have here? We have cosine squared. 
and we have over sine x. Done. So we had to do a lot of work on one side and then really just one simplification step there and off we went. So I put this one in the category of, you know, don't be afraid to, um, to write things in terms of sine and cosine. I'll pause for a second if you want to jot down any questions or any issues you have here. And then we'll move on to our third example. And this is going to be uh, page 359. Checkpoint six. So I'll go over to the checkpoint six. Um, what's fun is that I chose not to do the one that says two examples from calculus, because that would have been super fun. It's okay, we'll do checkpoint six. So we're looking at tangent squared theta. Don't get hung up on the different variables. It's just all uh, angles will be written as um, Greek letters in these problems. One minus, I guess you can see an X in there. There's X's there too. Cosine theta over cosine theta. So here's a couple of things I look at when I see a problem like this. First of all, this looks like a mess. And maybe 15 minutes ago, if you had sat down and looked at this one first, you'd be like, I don't know, how am I supposed to know how to do this? You're the teacher, you do it. But, but I do know that, that, for example, in the back of my mind, I can take this expression and I can separate it out into one over cosine theta minus cosine theta over cosine theta. Sorry, that's so sloppy. And this it becomes secant theta minus one. So I'm intrigued by that. And again, this is just sort of thinking out loud, thinking what could be there. I'm intrigued by that because it's very close to what I have right there. So, so I sort of use that as my uh, launch point for doing this problem. Oh good, I can't change color now. There we go. So let, let's go through this. This right here is a classic candidate for a difference of squares. So I'm gonna multiply by one minus secant theta and one minus secant theta there. And I, I will again draw your attention to this looking kind of like that, but not totally. So we've got some issues here. Okay, so this is gonna be one minus secant theta times tangent squared theta all over, now this is my difference of squares, one minus secant squared theta. Great, now it's just a bigger mess. But I know that when I get these ones and these um, you know, different ratios squared that I can go back over here and I can think about what does one minus secant squared look like? And I want you to really pay some attention to this middle Pythagorean identity right here. If I subtract one, I get secant squared minus one. That's not what I want. But if I subtract secant squared, I will get one minus secant squared. Remember, that's what we're looking for. I'm gonna go back over here so you can see it. We're trying to figure out what one minus secant squared looks like, this right here. So as I go back, one minus secant squared will require me to move the tangent squared to the right side also. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go write it on the side here just so we can have this written down. Um, we're gonna have a new version of this. I'm gonna write it way up on top so you can see it. The new version is gonna be um, one minus secant squared theta will equal negative tangent squared theta. So take a look at your identities and realize if we slide the secant squared to the left by subtraction, then I have to bump the tangent squared out of there, which is positive, so I subtract that over. So basically I'm subtracting the secant squared and the tangent squared so they switch sides, but this is what I can replace it with. So what I get now 
is one minus secant theta times tangent theta squared all over, be careful, negative tangent squared theta. Okay, so we're, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to keep the, uh, Let's keep the, this going on the same page. So I'm going to put this right up here. Now, clearly, we're going to be able to cancel out our tangent squareds, right? So I'm left with minus 1 minus secant theta. And remember, I said that what I had way over here looked very similar to what I had there, but it was slightly different. But look at this minus sign. Look what happens. How great is this? Minus 1 plus secant theta makes secant theta minus one. Hey, and so we can put a little equal sign there. I'll just write equals secant theta minus one, and we've got proved. Whew. So I, I want you to look back at, at the, these pages. I mean, th they start out fairly innocent, but then it gets pretty intense. That one wasn't bad, that one wasn't bad. That was a lot of work, this one. So remember our goals here are change A to B, change B to A, or change them both into something brand new and it might look like that. So I'm gonna let you go to work now on um, the next two assignments. So let me just jump ahead. We're gonna have, um, page 360, and it's 15, 20, oh, excuse me, 10, don't wanna miss out, 25, 30, 35, 40, and 43. That's gonna be 5.2a, and then we got 5.2b, um, which is, well, I'll just write it out for you because it's the kind of guy I am. 14, 17, 24, 27, 29, 33, 34, 44, 63 to 68. Okay, so uh, this will be for Monday. This is gonna be for Tuesday. And our plan still is that we will meet live Wednesday at 11 o'clock. There's two things I need to tell you. First of all, I need to send you the um, link and I will send that out probably, uh, you should have it by now. Um, I hope to have it out by the, by the weekend, by the end of the weekend or first of the week. And um, also, it looks like we're gonna have a staff meeting uh, at 10 o'clock that morning. So stay tuned. If it starts running along, I may have to shoot you all a quick text or, or check an email that we may have to push it back to 11.30. But I'm gonna stick with 11 o'clock. I don't know that, excuse me, we have that much to talk about, but um, we might. So um, hope you're doing well. Miss you guys. Uh, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Bye.